Hello everybody, welcome to the Espresso Shot Market Update. This is the second one. If you already followed the previous one, you know that we are going to deliver you some fast and interesting facts about the hotel market in Southeast Asia. If you haven't seen the previous one, please click on the link below. My name is Mauro Gasparotti. I'm a director of Service Hotel. I'm based in Ocimi City with my team, but I supervise consulting for the region. So today we're going to go to different markets in Southeast Asia. We're going to talk to our insider to really have their opinion, not just into the hotel performance, but also into the investment time. So if you are interested in a specific country, we'll recommend you to scroll the video and go into the market where you're most interested for. We'll start with Thailand today and we'll connect with the first insider. Okay, thank you very much. So our first guest here today, Mr. Jonathan Wingley, founder and CEO of Absolute Hotel Service. Absolute Group is one of the largest hospitality management and branding company in Southeast Asia and one of the fastest growing. They have more than 110 properties worldwide in 15 country he's also very active on social media he's very positive into into the way he see this crisis and see the future so we can't wait to wait his opinion over all the market condition now but also in the future thank you jonathan for joining us thank you my friend for having me it's a pleasure thank you thank you so please give us your opinion give us a brief into the market of thailand but you can really because you guys have so many properties really taking it um, um, outside as well, but we also like to know what's your secret in being so positive and so energetic. We all need this in this time. Please share with us your secrets and your insights. Well, sure. I mean, I think the unique thing of the pandemic is that everything has been, every, every place has been affected at the same time, in essence. So in the past, when we've had various crises, it's affected maybe Asia, or it's affected Europe, or it's affected North America. But having everything affected together, I think, is a unique thing for all of us. Um, I think, big picture, what we've seen is, is kind of a reversal of globalization a little bit in the hospitality context, where everybody started looking a little bit more insular, country to country, even before region to region. Um, our thought is always, adapt and or die. That's our philosophy. So it's not business as usual. It's not going to be business as usual for a while. So that means we have to look at what resources we have and what new revenue streams we can develop with those resources in those locations. So, so that's what we've been doing. Um, obviously, when the pandemic, we kind of spotted the potential pandemic implications quite early. So we did a, a pretty much mass closure of our 22 properties here in Thailand. Uh, I'll talk Thailand specific first, of which we've periodically we've opened all, reopened all but four properties to date. So obviously those properties in Thailand were focusing on domestic market or domestic generated incomes. The big issue, obviously, for here, us here in Thailand is domestic tourism traditionally hasn't been a, a major factor in our operations and our revenues and our incomes. But secondly, Bangkok obviously is not going to be a destination that we can expect much domestic demand. So I think those have been the, the challenges that we found in Thailand. Uh, obviously, our drive to locations, drive to locations out of Bangkok have been doing really well because the Thai market that does travel significantly overseas isn't able to do so. Um, the flip side of that, not just in Thailand, everywhere else, that the economic capacity of the domestic market will not go on forever. So that means they won't be able to keep spending as they've been spending today because obviously, which area of the economy, say technology, has not been impacted negatively, knock on effect by this. So I think those are our concerns. Um, obviously, Thailand has done a good job managing the pandemic from a number standpoint. Obviously, number of infections, number of deaths. So the public health, uh, let's say, focus has been really good. 
not so much on the economic side. Uh, and I think from what we would love to see in the industry is to see a planned date of reopening. Uh, then we can plan towards something. Naturally, that date can be adjusted and it's dependent on other countries, obviously outside of Thailand. But I mean, that's I think what the industry here in Thailand would like to see, have a plan and a date, which obviously can be amended if and when it needs to be. But then we've got something to work towards. I think from our standpoint, looking at adapt or die, what we've done, not just in Thailand, but across the board, we looked at our team and looked at our capabilities and thought, what can we do? So point one is we are just about to launch a design and concept company. We're offering interior design services and concept development for other parties because we have that skill set in house. To date, uh, there looks to be good, healthy, steady demand for that both within our own group and outside our own group. Second thing we've done is we've reached out to other hospitality related companies who maybe are having to um, trim down, but they still want to keep their business going. Uh, so, you know, trim down on their fixed costs. So we've offered outsource opportunities. They can outsource some of their operations or some of their functions to us at a cost effect, in a cost-effective manner. They get to keep their business, they get to keep their brand, and they get to grow their brand and their presence at the same time without the, how will I say it, without the stress and the pressure of carrying significant expenses with it. So those have been the real two ways we've, we've tried to adapt. Obviously, besides our core business, we've got, Throughout Asia, about 27 properties under various stages of development. So they're also keeping us busy because they're still moving along. Um, actually, to be honest, depending on how you look at it, this pandemic has caused somewhat of a correction uh, or will cause a correction in supply. And so it will take some supply out of market and also the supply that remains may not be in great shape due to the economic impacts. So in the next 12 to 24 months, bringing new supply on market may be a positive thing as, as we're looking at it, because it'll be new, uh, there'll be some supply taken off the market, and the balance of the supply that's endured the pandemic may not be in great shape. So, uh, I mean, that's, basically our outlook. Our biggest fear or concern that we've highlighted is not necessarily people's desire to travel. We believe strongly that will come back, starting regionally and spreading to Mongo Hall. It will be the airlift capacity that will remain. That's a, we've highlighted internally as a group, a big, a big concern there. Hopefully there'll be consolidation, uh, which will allow us to, um, to, to still have some significant airlift, but that's the way we're viewing things. And like I said, we're in a fortunate position. We've got, um, fortunately, we've got a strong economic background in terms of our enduring this pandemic. And we've got, um, obviously we've got some of our own asset, third party assets, so we can leverage off that as well. And to be honest, our philosophy was always to be lean and mean anywhere. So we weren't sat with a lot of inflated cost, cost base anyway. Thank you, Jonathan. And looking into the recovery, what do you think about 2021? Will be a slow path or do you think there will be a rebound given then they find a way to control this virus globally? Do you expect the tourists um, to re-jump back on a plane or, or to go back to 2019 level will take a few years? Um, I, well, I think none of us know, <laughs> to be honest. I think that's the big question. I think if we look back, sometimes we have to look back in history to learn about what the future will hold. After the last major pandemic, unfortunately termed as the Spanish flu, obviously tourism still, tourism still lived 
hospitality still lived, and I'm sure it will be in this case too. Um, I think, uh, firstly, I don't see any significant rebound um, in any form until the second half of next year. I think we'll start to see improvements from the second half of next year. I think obviously vaccine is one item, but that will take time to approve, um, manufacture and distribute. So I think that, I think it'll be more a case of us learning to live with the disease, realizing better what it is, what its potency is in terms of mortality rates, and how scared we should really be of it. I mean, we should be fearful of any disease. I think um, when we put, with greater knowledge, we'll be able to make better understanding. But I think, firstly, the desire will always be there to travel for whatever purpose, business, leisure, conference. I, 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 so I'm confident in that. I'm confident that people will also stay a bit closer to home. So I think regional travel will be the primary growth driver. I would say, if you ask my best guess, uh, which is a guess, I would say 2023, we will be back to 2019 levels. I think but from 21 onwards, we'll see continued improvement. Uh, like I said, that's my uh, best guess, or our best guess, I should say. Thank you, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, moving into investment, do you see opportunity? I know that you guys also acquired property, you acquired a few years ago a larger portfolio back in Europe. I'm sure you are looking at opportunity. You mentioned your potential partnership opportunity with some of the brands. How do you see this market now in terms of just investment and acquisition opportunity? There's plenty of money waiting to invest. Plenty. There are a lot of people are on the let's put it in Grand Prix terms, they're on the grid ready to start. They're just waiting for the deals to get to their best point. Uh, we feel we're gonna start to see significant movement in hospitality asset in investment towards the end of the year. I think that's because, the, unfortunately and sadly for many asset owners, by that time their financial position will be quite desperate. I think the banks will continue tightening uh, in relation to debt, and that will provide the opportunity for good deals in terms of investment. I think there'll be a lot of fund, uh, there's a lot of fund money waiting to come in. So our strategy on a non-asset platform is to maybe work with a couple of these funds to go through the process of analyzing potential deals and then working together on management and branding uh, going forward. From an investment standpoint, obviously we'll be looking at potential investment deals, ideally on a portfolio basis, rather than an individual hotel. That will be very dependent on geography. Um, if we're talking here in Asia, we do like Vietnam in terms of an investment. Uh, portfolio. Obviously, Japan is also interesting. Uh, even Indonesia, Philippines, uh, we're considering quite interesting. And also, uh, India and Europe is something that we'll continue to look at. So, I'd love to tell you, like many companies do, that we have a very strategic approach to this, but it's very hard to be strategic when there's so many unknowns. So we will definitely veer on the side of opportunistic uh, rather than strategic. And in your, well, in your office uh, town, in your hometown, where you guys are based, would you still acquire a few assets? What location in Thailand do you think you should be there that you are not, or which one do you prefer to move into? Well, we've got quite a lot of our own, our own asset or related part of asset under development ourselves. So, uh, for example, in Bangkok, we have three properties under various stages of development already. Uh, those are due to come online um, 22 and 23 uh, as well. So, uh, to be honest, from our standpoint, uh, Bangkok were pretty well covered. 
Um, to be honest, we're quite well covered in Thailand on our four and five and four star level brands. So where we look for potential investment and growth opportunity would be at, a, at the three plus star level uh, with our Travelodge brand, uh, to be honest. But that being said, um, if an opportunity presents itself, uh, we, we look at it on a case, case by case basis. I think um, we're a bit more optimistic on beach destinations in Vietnam uh, than we are in Thailand, uh, purely because of the supply uh, situation. That being said, obviously, uh, Thailand will continue to be a major player on the uh, demand map for tourism and leisure travel. But um, definitely in terms of future investment, we would mainly focus on our travel lodge brand in, here in Thailand. Exactly. Thank you, Jonathan. I talk even more of time of what we decided initially. So it's always a pleasure to talk to you, have your opinion, always very positive, very energetic, very good for all of us. We are all are your follower into all your, your social media channels. So thank you very much for joining us today and looking forward to see you again in Vietnam or in Thailand as soon as they open the cross board. Thank I look you. forward to that. And just, and just thanks again for the platform to be able to, I mean, we've worked a lot with Saddles during the years and yourself specifically. So thank you for that support. One last thing I'd like to give a message to all our hospitality related partners. Stay optimistic, look for opportunities. If you have an opportunity of something that I've highlighted, please talk to us and we're happy to consider. We will only survive this well working together as an industry. And we are open, willing and able to cooperate in any form and look at any opportunity. Stay positive, guys. Love and peace to all. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. It was very interesting to talk to Jonathan about Thailand. We move now to Japan, where my colleague Ichikawa-san is waiting for us to share a bit into Japan market. We're connecting to Ichikawa-san, director of a service hotel Japan, and one of the best, if not the best, hotel brokers in the country. Ichikawa, thank you for being with us. Of course. Uh, more than welcome, and uh, we're always you know, happy to you know, join this type of things anyway. Thank you, thank you. So please share with us a bit into the Japan situation, performance, hotel, what's going on over there. But later on, we'll also like to pick your brain into the investment side and just give us an update of what we should expect from that um, area. Okay, got it. So the, first of all, the uh, the, when we're looking at the you know, year-to-date performance 2020, uh, in Japanese, and, uh, I mean, in general, labor power numbers, is getting down from the last year, like a 70%. It's a huge hit, almost in the same, same as, a, as a country, but especially the Tokyo and Osaka and, Osaka and the other major cities were heavily hit because of the, that city, you know, since we had a uh, state, uh, state of emergency from the Japanese government, which was in uh, April, and since then, that impact was huge. Ag again, the Osaka, this major Tokyo, this major city, that did have a huge impact because of, we did have a major, you know, uh, 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 appreciation or, you know, benefit from the, inbound guest since uh, 2013 anyway. So, uh, but anyway, uh, that type of you know, situation we are still seeing, we didn't, we have several recovery on the local city, but Tokyo and Osaka is sitting like a still lower occupancy area. That's the current general situation. The, some market they rely more into local travelers. You mentioned yeah. that maybe Tokyo they had this larger inbound of, of uh, foreign travelers and therefore they fell a bit more. But some market you feel that are okay overall, surviving with the local Japanese travelers? 
Yeah, as you might know, the Japanese market, I mean, domestic market quite strong. Even before we, you know, we changed our policy since 2013. Our, you know, recently designed Mr. Abe. He is the one, he decided to change the entire policy, 2013. Then our, you know, the guests from the international, I mean, international market is uh, almost you know, tripled. Right? That you know, is the, you know, one of the major impact for the growth of you know, leisure market in Japan. Even though, before that, domestic market is quite strong. Uh, even last year, the, almost 70 or maybe 80% of the you know, leisure revenue comes through the Japanese domestic travelers. So that's why probably the, the any other country could have uh, the same policy, but uh, it's Japanese on, uh, leisure businesses people decided focusing on more local businesses. And so Japanese government also uh, decided to provide like a, let's say the go-to campaign, which gives the you know, traveler to assist certain benefit like uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the support to pay for the travel things. It just started last month, but we need to slightly change, like a uh, modify, to be much better in you know, uh, structure. Even though that helps us, our you know, next several months is revenue for the uh, domestic, you know, the leisure businesses at all. Do so, but. Do you feel that people are scared now? Japanese are scared to travel or they start to move as before? Or they still uh, be worried about getting into the plan? It depends on the where you are living. So people in Tokyo is kind of scaring to do something because of uh, most of the, you know, uh, uh, how can I say, the COVID people, I, I mean, the getting inf infected people is uh, staying here, Tokyo. The major, major impact, I mean, major city is Tokyo, Tokyo area. So, but locally, uh, these are uh, still increasing, but number is a kind of the moderate. So, uh, domestic, the local city like Fukuoka or maybe a, uh, uh, Hiroshima and maybe Hokkaido and uh, any other city is getting much better, which means uh, uh, just only the occupancy rise. Area is still still. And, and also, I guess Japan market was a very strong outbound tourism, so they used to go to Thailand, to, right. to Vietnam, Singapore. Now, being only in their own country, they probably travel more within their country. Uh, to discover Japan, if you like that whole thing. So that, that's probably the other positive sign that you'll see over there. Yeah, yeah the cu currently, still we are seeing, uh, you know, most of the country, uh, between the country and uh, our country does have a restriction to travel among us, right? In that case, the, like a international traveler, former international traveler wants to do something but there is no nowhere to go. Some part of the people come uh, go into there. I mean, the, any domestic area. That's a good thing for us. Last year we are uh, we saw like uh, almost fifteen to twenty million Japanese people went out to you know overseas. It's a huge number still, right? And uh, spending four five days. Uh, I, I'm not, I don't have an you know, exact number, but uh, kind of a good amount of uh, you know payment they did. That are interesting. And uh, that has to help our le domestic leisure businesses. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and the performance you say pretty much is a week everywhere or some of the area in Japan, they're actually getting through this period quite fine. What we mm -hmm. see from all statistics that everything that is drive by destination, so everything that can be reached by a car, seems that the market is still pretty, pretty solid. Do you have any specific location in Japan that are still fine? 
Uh, we are now seeing the surrounding area in Tokyo metropolitan. You know, do you know that area called Hakone and the I south, uh, uh, west, south, southwest? Yeah, they're so close. They are the ones, I mean, hot spring and uh, close to the Mount Fuji and uh, uh, besides the sea. And, uh, you know, uh, it's easy to, you know, go like, uh, uh, maybe the, if you don't have any traffic jam, you can go just one month from that, you know, center of the Tokyo. And a good area to spend. And uh, just forest, even the sea, and a uh, lot of good food. And uh, uh, many ryokan and the hot spring again. So that's one of them. And the north part, we can, you can go to see, like, uh, we can go to see. Uh, the Nasu or maybe Nikko, Nikko area. The, uh, Latin. This summer just opened Ritz Carlton Nikko. That's one of the you know attraction for the, the luxury. I mean people. I mean the people who may have a you know, good amount of money to spend. So, thank you, thank you, Shansa. Anything more on the market before we move into investment? Ah, uh, probably uh, we should go. Uh, we should go to the you know capital market to the capital market, which is very interesting. We know that you are by far the expert there, so I will not even ask a question. I will just, please, take us through the situation of investment in Japan. Okay, so uh, in general idea about, you know, real estate trading in Japan, uh, it's still quite hot. And uh, several deal, uh, not for the hotel and the retail, like a, just, you know, low land to develop almost everything and like a residential or maybe the office building, it's so difficult to get. Like, a, you know, uh, we can say that uh, before COVID and after COVID, cap rate has to be stay same. In, uh, and maybe the, I can say that in residential uh, warehouse, the same cap rate or applicable. But, so that's a general idea. And uh, as you know, the uh, money flow from the you know, central government, it's, it's a still huge. Affordable money to you know, capital market is huge. That's why real estate is one of them. So even though uh, volume of uh, hotel transaction in Japan market is getting worse, like uh, just comparing last year, like a 46% decline. It's a huge difference because of uh, everyone wants to buy the property, especially the hotel, needs to be there, right? But we cannot go to see. It's a one of the reasons. And also, one of the uh, major, major reasons is the, the banks doesn't like to go to put any money at this point for the hotel property. So, uh, several reasons, but hotel, uh, capital market means you know trade volume of the hotel is getting slow and uh, I don't see any major you know uh, good fact or maybe the I and uh, items we can push up for a while probably it's take first things we need to look at that is uh, we need to look into this uh, you know behavior of the banks Bank needs to spend something, and uh, but it takes some time. So anyway, the we have seen just one transaction over, especially cross borders project is a uh, transaction has not been occurred. Just one, I we are you know realize, which is a uh, village hotel Ariaki uh, purchase. Yeah. And it's just about 8.2 billion Japanese yen and over, slightly over 400 ki. That's the only one we recognize. And any other smaller, trans, not small, like a medium, medium size of the transaction has been occurred, which is a unit. Uh, last year, that company decided to sell entire portfolio, over 20 property to the market. The, most of the people, try to buy like a opportunity fund or maybe the even the operators, they would like to buy, but that it was not a few hotel 
has been traded, but the most of them stay, you know, uh, stay same. Uh, Sarah cannot make a deal, make a deal. So, a uh, few of them, which is uh, Unizo uh, Shinbashi and uh, Unizo Kyo, Shibuya, these two we recognize has been traded. So, uh, again, the, I like to just express about uh, the who's the current buyer on this market. So, uh, as I uh, as you might uh, imagine, so we you, we supposed to have an Olympic game this year, right? Towards that Olympic game, uh, most of, uh, a lot of many of real estate player, non hotel player, coming to this market, like uh, to build for the new build, new properties, new product. But these people already gone. They cannot come back to this you know, se sector anymore at this point. That's why uh, now I'm seeing few opportunity funds are looking at to buy. And uh, probably owner operator from the overseas who is quite active to come into this market. These two kind of the uh, investor, maybe the buyer, is uh, are recognizing at this point, recognized. So even though uh, again, uh, bank cannot make a you know debt means opportunity fund cannot make you know uh, achieve the, their required return. Maybe owner operator could have, these are the strategic buyer rather than financials, right? That's why. This buyer could not get the property uh, last three or four years because of the competition is quite tough. Like a J Japan hotel, Japanese hotel lead, or maybe any other, uh, there are many, many buyer to you know, try to acquire the property, especially Tokyo and Osaka, maybe Kyoto. But at this point, there's uh, only few people who can you know, afford to buy. So, that's why now I'm seeing strategic buyer, like owner operator, try to trying to buy a property in good location. That's the current situation. And do you see distressed asset coming? Do you think a lot of assets will come into the market end of this year or next year? Yeah. Uh, again, the uh, uh, how can I say, the owners of this property, we have two, two uh, categories. One is owner operator, one is uh, just owner and with tenant or maybe operator. The, you know, owner operator could maintain the, their cash flow because of the, they have a you know, huge, I mean, good background for the real estate also. But owner, Landlord with tenant, maybe landlord or operator, that they have a huge, uh, huge concern about their future cash flow. That things may come out to the market next six months. Uh, in general, the Ministry of Financing uh, just announced us like uh, in general idea of the like. Uh, Available cash on the average Japanese account corporation is 2.8 to 6.8 months. That are in general ideas. So let's say the COVID started like a March, the short for shortage of the cash may start in this summer, right? So the even operate, I mean, even the maybe next few months, uh, some operator just you know uh, surrender to pay anything. Then in that cases, lender decided to you know push to sell to the owners. Maybe the owner or maybe asset manager try to sell in the maximum prices. So, but I haven't seen a lot at this point. This you know situation, not yet. Thank you, thank you. Um, so it's very interesting. Uh, probably 2021 will. We'll see more 
more of this opportunity coming, and especially when the people would be able maybe to travel again uh, and to capture, to actually come and see see the problem. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. The especially again the uh, capital market itself is still healthy, right? And the financial I mean, institution is have a huge, you know, backup from the I mean the I mean the central bank, but the finally, you know, you know, investor realize hotel is not you know investment grade. I can say you know investment grade some of them, but most of the hotel does doesn't have a you know step like a farm cash flow from the operation, right? Yeah, finally they realize. That's why domestic people will take some time to come back this type of opportunity. Okay, thank you very much uh, for joining us again. It was a pleasure to, to talk to you and to have this, this market update. Hopefully we we'll have you every few months to, to, to keep us and all the viewers updating the Japan market, which of course we know is one of the, the most popular and most wanted market for the okay. region. Yeah, sounds nice. Thank you, thank you, Richard. Okay. Well, definitely Japan is an extremely interesting country to watch closer this year, but also next year. We'll move now to a bit closer. We'll uh, go to connect to Malaysia. Our guest today connecting from KL and uh, will take us through Malaysia, the Malaysian markets. Uh, Previn, the founder and CEO of Zarin Property, Malaysia Boutique Real Estate Investment House specialized in hotel this corporate real estate, property management, and consulting. Welcome to our espresso shot, Previn. Thank you, Mauro. Good to be here. Really happy that you have me on. Good. Thank you. Thank you. We don't touch Malaysia a lot, but hopefully, hopefully today you'll take us through a bit of understanding of what's going on here and what's your vision for the future. Uh, we know that you do both consultancy, but also you're one of the... the the most established hotel broker there. So we'll also like to have your opinion into the investment market, um, both in the region, but also in the, in the single city, in the main city, but pretty much everywhere over there. So please, I pass the microphone to you. What's going on in Malaysia and how the future will look like? All right, thank you, Maro. Um, you know, uh, once the uh, mandatory uh, control order was implemented on 18 March, um, occupancy just dropped, right? You know, it was close to 5% for some because they had some tourists who were still uh, delayed. And, um, you know, our advice then was just to temporarily shut down some of the hotels and wait till interstate travel. Once interstate travel happened within Malaysia, the domestic tourism has really been booming, right? Um, we found that um, most of the islands, Perhentian, Redang, Tioman, Langkawi, uh, the big ones, those are all full during the weekends, uh, some hitting close to 100% occupancy during the weekends. For places like Penang, and uh, Penang is fantastic uh, because they have a lot of weekday tourists as well. And um, they are, some of our clients' hotels, they are closing about, uh, close July at 75% and will be closing August at about 78%. Um, the bigger cities, however, are suffering. I mean, we have some hotels which are used as quarantine centers. So they are, you know, getting good uh, occupancies. But generally, the occupancies are very low um, at this juncture in the cities, um, within 15 to 30 percent. Uh, and again, uh, there are peaks uh, during the longer weekends or the longer holidays. Uh, we are seeing some peaks as well, right? Um, most of the buyers uh, were on the sidelines before, but uh, with the opening of the borders, um, we have actually seen, uh, and with the domestic tourism increasing, we've actually seen our investors coming back in and starting to look into investments in throughout Malaysia. And why do you think the domestic tourist is increasing? Because now they are not going overseas anymore. They're not going to Singapore and they, they want to explore their own city. Or maybe they, they're happy just to drive by uh, somewhere they don't want to get international. Travel. Why do you think is it actually increasing? I think because, you know, they've just been locked up too long. Maro. Everybody wants to have a holiday and, you know, um, school is about to start. So 
There's a lot of interstate travel. And I think it was just, um, as I said, they were locked down too long, right? And when the borders opened, everybody went to four holidays, right? Um, especially the, the dive resorts, everywhere is full. And, you and think the golf resorts as well. This would be until the end of the year or would just this summer period? I, I think this will be continuous uh, until end of the year, until we hear what's the latest, because we are still under a uh, restricted movement control order now until the 31st of December. You think the rate has been uh, dropped in to, to attract more uh, local uh, market or pretty much do you are looking at the same rate as last year? Or, um, surprisingly, we have seen uh, rates similar to last year for those hotels that are doing very well, right? Um, uh, at the resort destinations, their rates are actually holding. Okay. And yeah, but the ones in the cities are a bit iffy at the moment, yeah. Yeah. When do you think the full recovery will come? Let's assume, when do you think the 2019 level will be back? Are we looking at next year or you are one of the, the people that's looking to two, three years time to really go back to the golden age of 19? You know, 2019 wasn't such a great year for us as well, right, Mario? Yeah. You know, I think it was uh, 2017, 2018 that was really uh, up there. But I think if you really want to see whether how we will hit a better stage. I, I really think for most probably second half of next year, um, you know, a lot of the experts are saying the vaccine uh, would probably take that long to, to arrive. And I also think, um, you know, the, there is a theory that, uh, you know, we will be, we, the pandemic will actually evolve itself to be a flu in order to sustain itself longer. So, you know, if that happens, and I think when borders open up, um, I think that's when it's going to happen, but I still think it will take an, at least another six months, Maro. And also the good news in, in Malaysia is probably you have a lot of inter-Asia um, um, travelers, which is the preferred option for Asia now. They, they will wait to go back to US or to Europe for a while. So destinations like Malaysia or Vietnam or Thailand or Indonesia will be probably the favorite option for next year before yeah. going yeah. going. I, I think regional tourism and, you know, if um, our countries uh, actually form the travel bubble, right, I think uh, that would actually be very good for the region, right? Uh, now there's already travel between Malaysia and Singapore. It's already open, but restricted purely for work. Yep. Okay, thank you, Bevin. Looking into the investment, so digging a bit more. No, you're not done yet. You think you do? Stay with us two minutes more. Distress assets, what is yep. coming in, in KL or in the region? Do you see those number of distress coming or shall we wait a bit longer or they may never really come as investors expected? From the investor perspective, I think um, there are good purchases to, uh, in the market. I think um, if, if you look to distress assets, let's say through, through debt recovery or liquidation, uh, they are, but not necessarily the best of assets. But what we are seeing is our owners who are motivated to sell, they've already imputed an impairment of about 20 to 30 percent. Right? And I think that's what, you know, for the better assets, I think that's what uh, is going to happen for now. But uh, the ones that are really distressed, not necessarily the best quality assets, uh, Maru, you know. So we will see probably in the market something that was not available before at now. Yes. And a better price than before. That's what you think. Yes, that, that's definitely already happening. And we are seeing it at, um, at all levels, at the three star, four star, five star, and the luxury level as well. And do you think this is happening or it will keep happening more and more? So shall investor wait or already come to, through, through company like you to looking for deal now? I, I think it's already happening. You know, transactions are already taking place. Uh, discussions are ongoing. Um, as I said, the, the, the investors were in the sidelines before, but I think when they saw the improvement of the domestic tourism, investors are already uh, willing to actually uh, look and into those hot locations, right? Penang, Langkawi, the islands, Sabah. You know, I think uh, people are already looking at it. An investor will be a regional investor or any specific country that it's looking at Malaysia heavily. Are you talking to some investor already? Yes, um, local, number one, of course, local investors. You know, I think uh, they are taking the opportunity now uh, because of the, you know, lack of travel and lack of people coming in. So they are actually leading 
the investor pool. But surprisingly, we are, we are getting a lot of inquiries from Singapore and Hong Kong still. Okay, good, good. So you'll be busy this year, but also next year, I guess everybody yeah. will be will be coming. Yeah, so I, think, one of the, I think we want to be busy, Mauro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's coming back. One of our discussion earlier with the Japan team was that there are opportunities available, but it's just more difficult for people to actually go and visit physically the property. Yes. So the inspection right. part is not, so everybody's somehow moving and waiting in the country to open up, to actually go ahead with those deals. Yeah, yeah, but it's a bit different here. Yeah, I think the investors are already in the market. You know, this probably happened about a month ago, right? When the when you know when they actually saw the impact of the domestic tourism. So there was a good good news, and actually, it should mean that the base of the tourism is pretty strong. Few countries have seen that kind of supporting business from the local tourists: Vietnam, Thailand. But a lot yes. of them is not enough to actually really come to a positive GOP. Thank you very much, Harry, for joining us. I like you go because I know you have a, a very busy day. Hopefully, we we'll have you more and more in some of the data. Hopefully, coming with a good news every time. Thank you very much. Thank you, buddy. Thanks, Varo. Appreciate it. Okay, very interesting uh, Malaysian country and conversation. Now we'll move to connect to the next country. Thank you very much. We'll move to last country today. We'll look it into Hong Kong. And here we'll, uh, we'll be with uh, Mr. Noel Maranier, v Vice President of Rosewood Hotel Group. Thank you for joining, Noel. Thank you, Mario. Great to be here. Okay, good. We had a few try on the connection. Now seems working pretty well. Please take us through the Hong Kong market situation. But also we like to know a bit into Rosewood situation overall uh, in Asia Pacific, which country maybe are doing better than other. Sure, sure. Uh, sure, well, um, I can speak pretty much anecdotally um, uh, from, from my experience. Um, and um, well, first, when you asked about you know, the Hong Kong market, I, I thought, well, there isn't, you know, what market really? Um, Hong Kong, of course, is a, um, uh, is a small place. I mean, it's, it's a major city, but, um, but it's a city on its own. Um, and uh, since the spring, um, since measures were put into place over COVID, um, uh, visitation has been has been prohibited. Only uh, permanent, um, no hotel demand really to speak of. And this has also been a place where um, there isn't because we're so, so small. There isn't a need for local demand. There isn't domestic travel. Um, in some places around the region, like uh, in Japan and, and Korea. Um, Staycations are popular, but that's something that's never um, taken hold here. Um, people do seem to get out of town. It's been, um, you know, very highly um, occupied and 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 um, not inexpensive. I mean, up until uh, the year before last, it, you know, we were a high 80s percent mar uh, market, um, even in the luxury end. Um, the hotels stay pretty pretty high uh, high occupancies at very solid rates. Um, but um, of the market now, we've, we've been, um, we've actually we've been, we've had sort of two gut punches. I mean, last year we had uh, the political issues. Um, so pre, pre COVID, um, Hong Kong, the Hong Kong hotel market was already struggling because of the political uh, situation and, and uh, the, um, the uh, image, you know, that was projected abroad of, of the protests here. Um, and then, and then came COVID. Um, but I, you know, I like to be, uh, an optimist, and so I, you know, in in despite you know these um, these challenges, I mean, there are some bright spots, and I think you know they're 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 particular to us, um, and we're, we're learning a lot from this. I think that we can um, uh, that will give us an advantage you know, when we come out of this, um, and that the, the the positivity is well, first, um, as far as when we pass through COVID, when we get through it, um, I think Hong Kong will, will come back. Um, the political issues um, have been dealt with. Um, the new, with the new national security law, I'm not, you know, um, uh, I mean, everyone has opinions about that. But um, but what is certain is that the um, that the political situation is tamped down, and Hong Kong will be a, a safe, uh, convenient for travelers from all over. Um, and um, you know, and Hong Kong as well. I mean, I'm used to traveling. Uh, every week. I, I never, you know, I've been grounded here since March. 
Um, I love Hong Kong um, and I've gotten to really um, experience it now. Um, and I, you know, I think me and a lot of my, you know, my, my, my friends and coworkers, we have a newfound appreciation for Hong Kong. So I think it will come back um, as a great destination. Um, I think in the, uh, on the luxury end, um, there's no question. Um, you know, I, I think the mass market, the middle tier, the mainland, uh, mainland uh, leisure business um, will be harder to recover. Um, and so the, the mid-tier big box hotels, it will be a struggle. Um, but Hong Kong is, 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 going, is, is, is one of the most, um, it's, it's, it's a must destination list. Um, it's a place where travelers from around the region come on a regular basis. Um, and for any affluent traveler, um, it's on their list. Um, and that's because of the beauty of, 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 the, of, the, of the territory, um, also good weather, um, you know, great food, great people, great culture, lots to do, lots to see. So um, I, you know, I think at the luxury end, um, we'll come back. Um, no, no, no problem about that. But in the interim, you know, while I was working through, through COVID, um, it, is, it is a struggle. Um, so look, talking about our hotel, we opened the Rosewood Hong Kong uh, last, uh, early last year. You know, uh, challenging time to open a hotel. Our timing wasn't great, but, um, but the hotel is built to last and endure, and I'm sure that um, you know, we'll, we'll get past the current situation and, um, and, and, and the hotel will be a success. And it already is um, relatively successful, despite the, the challenges that and, um, and those challenges, you know, we, uh, Hong Kong has flexed quite a bit on, on, on the restrictions and, um, you know, uh, our authorities are, um, are you know, really on top of the situation. So we've kind of gone back and forth with, you know, opening things up and then closing things down and having, you know, some restrictions on, on, on hours that restaurants can be open, number of, 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 of patrons that can be seated, occupancy levels in restaurants, spas, fitness clubs, pools, you know, open, close. So that we're going, we're going back and forth there a little bit. Um, but the situation seems to be under control. Um, and in more recent months, we've, uh, the summer, we've, we've had um, some periods where um, we've had some stability, some normalcy. Um, now, during this period, we, you know, our, our, our competitors, um, some very established, um, really highly regarded luxury hotels, have a lot of been open for a long time here. Um, you know, they've, they've gotten to maybe just break through the single digit occupancy level. Um, we've been running a multiple of that. Um, and, you know, our hotel is not small, it's 400 plus rooms. Um, and over the summer months, um, we have actually gotten to you know, 50, 60% occupancy on the weekends. Um, all local business. You know, people are just cooped up. They, they want something to do. They want to they change the scene. Um, and they're attracted to our hotel because it is the full package, right? I mean, our hotel is unique in the city because it's almost like, um, like a resort uh, that's vertical in the city. Um, and, um, and so it's become the place to kind of hang out on the weekends. Um, so I, I think moving forward, um, you know, we'll see, I think this will be maybe a longer term phenomenon that we'll see, you know, um, uh, local demand in hotels in Hong Kong. Um, and um, I, I think that may become part of people's regular lives that occasionally, um, on the weekends, I want to want to check into a hotel, particularly a hotel like ours. Strong weekend demand. We've also been able to achieve this without um, discounting, um, and our rates are very strong. Um, our average rates for the past few months have been running over eight hundred US dollars, um, and in particular. Um, suites are in, in really high demand. Um, even on, on some weekends, we sell out completely of suites and the biggest suites. Um, so that's positive. So, 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 um, and then on, with our food and beverage, we have six out of our eight outlets open. Uh, in June, we, um, we, were only, we, we ran 80% of our budgeted revenue, um, you know, all on local demand, even with some restrictions. In our hotel. Thank you, thank you, Joel. Um, moving out from Hong Kong and looking at all the other Rosewood in, uh, in Asia, if you like, which one you think is it's fully on the way to recover, or while which one are still somehow waiting the market to come back, maybe even before open? And do you have all of them are open, or some of them stay closed? 
Um, uh, some of them um, are still closed. Um, um, I believe at the moment, uh, uh, Rosewood Yangon, uh, Luang, um, Luang Prabang, um, uh, and um, uh, uh, Phuket um, are closed. Um, and um, but you know where I look to to um, hotels that are well not even on on the way to recover are fully recovered, and then some are um, are just across the border in mainland China. Um, so our hotel in um, in Sanya uh, has been running 90 plus occupancy this summer, um, and um, rates that are 50 percent or more above budgeted levels. Um, so that speaks to, to the demand, you know, the pent up demand that exists in mainland China. Um, even our um, uh, uh, more recent opening, uh, we opened the Rosewood Guangzhou in September of last year. Um, and last month it ran 92, 90, low 90% occupancy and really, really strong rates. Um, again, speaking to um, you know, that, that pent up demand and, and, and the importance that, that travel and hospitality experiences have uh, for the um, affluent Chinese customer. Um, we also opened um, just about a month ago, um, one of our first um, cost properties. Cost is our new uh, luxury lifestyle brand that you'll be hearing more about um, in the coming months. Um, and we opened um, 60 plus for 70% occupancies. In the first few weeks uh, of that hotel being open, Again, it's an entirely new brand and entirely new concept. Um, so, um, so we feel good about, um, actually really good about, um, about the demand in China. It's more than recovered and I understand even uh, domestic air travel, uh, passenger appointments as of this week are back to pre-COVID levels. Um, so there's, you know, there's a fair bit to be positive about. And when you open up China and you open up that, that it's not just a, you know a, the, the demand and the importance of travel and hospitality experiences. It's not just particular to China. It's, it's a regional thing. But I think when you open up China and when you open up more more countries, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic and, and feel good about you know the recovery here. Is your pipeline still ongoing, or some hotel has been somehow delayed in terms of just pre-opening or construction? No, I mean our pipeline actually is is holding. Um, our um, I mean, you know, there, it's, we, we've adapted um, to the new normal of, of, of working, you know, uh, and supporting the projects um, uh, through the, you know, the design and project phase. Um, it's a challenge to do, you know, without travel. Um, but, but we found a way. I um, mean, everyone has kind of improvised. It's a little more, tri it's a little bit more tricky to do. Um, it's, it's always much easier to, to get everyone in a room together and speak eye to eye and face to face and rather you know, having Zoom connections and, 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 and those challenges uh, and, um, you know, uh, everything in email. Um, but, um, but we've adapted and, and it's holding. Um, we went into the year with a very, and we've got some you know, great blue chip owners who have a similarly long view through this as, as we do. Um, and um, so in the coming months, you'll be hearing some exciting news from the region, uh, particularly around the, more the North Asia region. We've done really well in Southeast Asia. But now we're um, uh, we're moving into Northeast Asia, um, so so stay tuned there. Some great projects coming, um, and globally, I'd say as well. Um, we've been you know busy as ever. Um, we most recent announcements um, give you an indication of kind of what you might see more of moving forward. Um, we recently, in the past uh, month or two, announced um, that we'll be taking over a couple of really legendary hotels. Um, Liguahani in St. Bart's in the Caribbean, Villa Magna in Madrid. Um, and we still see quite a bit of um, opportunity and demand um, for um, uh, independent hotels um, that are unique and have a legacy and, and you know, just need a, a refresh and, you know, uh, need to be infused with our, um, with our design aesthetic, with our culture. Um, and, um, and, uh, and owners of these hotels see an opportunity to, to make some changes now while the market is, is down and then come out uh, on the other side of all this with a, you know, with a, with a new, uh, uh, you know, reinvigorated uh, Rosewood product. So we're excited about the opportunities there and we're working on more projects like that. Okay, thank you very much. I think there was a bit longer than just the espresso uh, that we, we, we usually do, but very informative and very positive as well. So thanks for sharing with me and thanks for sharing to everybody else. 
hopefully we'll see you in the next high cup or in the next event or or or, or somewhere in this uh, in this part of the region soon as soon as the the fly reopen thank you very much thanks for having me and that was all for today thank you very much everybody to follow the espresso shop stay in touch for the next month and stay tuned also for our media expert event in Ocimi City in October.